All right. Uh, well, let's go ahead and uh, let's turn our Bibles, if you have them, to James chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 11. So James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. In your bulletins, uh, it, it might actually go to verse 12. And in your small groups, you probably uh, recognize that you covered up to verse 12. But today, we're just going to look at verse 11. Next week, we'll pick up at verse 12 and finish off, okay? But we're nearly finished with our study through the book of James <laughs> okay, you guys are like, let's get more, right? Let's keep going. Uh, but we've been at this for 11 weeks now, okay? 11 weeks in this series, so we have uh, one more message next week, and then we'll be done, okay? Uh, and in case any of you are kind of bummed out right now because you're relatively new, maybe you're even new today or streaming in for the very first time, uh, we welcome you, but maybe you're bummed because you missed the whole series, uh, you need not despair, because all of our messages, you guys should know, they're on our website. They're online on our Facebook page. You can go to our website to access them. So you can check those out if uh, you like. Uh, but today we're looking at James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. And we're going to talk about patience. Patience. The title of our message today is Be Patient. I want you to turn to one another and say, Be Patient. If you're at home watching with someone, say, be patient. Or you could type, be patient, okay? Uh, and, and I think that this is a pretty relevant word for all of us right now as we are all in a situation with this COVID-19 that's been going on for so long uh, where our patience is being tested, right? Like we're asking things like, how much longer is this going to last, how much longer am I going to have to wear these masks and smell my stinky breath all day? <laughs> like, I can't stand that. Ugh. How much longer am I going to have to practice social distancing? How much longer am I not going to be able to just hug and embrace my friends? For those of you at home uh, that haven't been able to come to church, maybe you're asking, how much longer until I can come to church? Hopefully you're asking that, okay? Hopefully you haven't just gotten so comfortable. You're like, this is great. I just want to stay home all the time. I hope that's not the case, but that you're longing to return to us because, again, we, we're missing you guys. We're not, the body is not complete without you, okay? For those of you with children, at, probably at home again, maybe you're asking how much longer until my kids can finally get a normal schedule going to school. <laughs> so hard, right? This, this routine is always getting broken up. How much longer until we could travel again? I want to go and travel the world. How much longer until the vaccine finally comes out? Like, we're all in a season where we have to be patient, right? We don't have a choice. Like, we have to be patient. And I think that this is especially difficult for us living in Korea. Because we live in one of the fastest countries on the planet. Did you know that? <laughs> like one of the fastest places in the world. This is the land of pali pali, right? If you've never heard that before, you don't know what that means. It means quick, quick, hurry, hurry, pali pali. We want everything fast. Everything here is so fast. Like if it takes more than five whole seconds to load a web page on your smartphone, it's too long, right? It's unthinkable. Like, I got to get a new phone. I got to get new internet service. This is way too slow. Think about that. Five whole seconds, right? So fast. If it takes, uh, when you order on a coupon, how many of you guys order on coupon? Okay, a, a bunch of you, right? I order on coupon. But if it takes more than a day for your delivery to come. Like if that rocket sign is not there that tells you you better order right now and so it'll come before 7 a.m. tomorrow, you know what I'm talking about, right? If that's not there, too long. I can't wait a day. I can't wait two days. Are you kidding me for my order? I need it now, right? For those of you who do delivery, take, uh, you know, pedal, right? If I don't get my kyochan chicken in at least 45 minutes, and, and that's pretty long, right? 45 minutes Forget about it. That's way too long. I'm going to starve while I wait for this coach. I can't do that. I need it in 30 or less, right? We live in a pali pali world. Everything's so fast. We want everything faster and faster and faster. And that even translates into our spiritual lives as well, right? We want God to work fast. We want fast growth. 
I want to be changed quickly. We want fast healing. Heal me now. I want to be delivered from this sin right now. God, work fast, fast, fast. When actually, the consistent message of the Bible is be patient. Be patient. Be patient. Wait for the Lord. Be still. When was the last time you were still? Persevere. Endure. Be patient. God wants us to be a patient people. It's why it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, patience. He wants to develop patience in every single one of his followers. And so James, he knows this. In our passage today, he exhorts us, all of us, living in such a fast-paced, impatient world, to be patient. And I pray that God would give all of us willing ears to listen and most importantly, a open and soft heart to receive his word and to believe it and to act upon it. And uh, we need Holy Spirit's work for that always. And so let's pray. Let's pray right now. Let me ask God for his help. Father in heaven, we ask today that your name would be hallowed that your name would be prized above every other name, that your name would be the, the name that we adore in our hearts today. And we ask that your kingdom would come here in this very room and in our very hearts today as it is in heaven. Align us with the mindset and the pattern of heaven today. Do it as we look into your word. And Holy Spirit, you know how resistant we can be. You know how our flesh can so often not want to obey the word word of God. Just say, it's too hard. This makes me uncomfortable. It's too challenging. Holy Spirit, you know this, and so we need your help. We need your help right now for any of us who are, who've got stubbornness in our heart, who's got sin there, who's just got hardened areas where we just won't allow the word of God to, to hit us. Holy Spirit, invade our hearts with the gospel right at this very moment and remind us Christ is the Lord and he loves us. He died so that we could be free from sin, so that we could live lives of abundant lives, of freedom and joy and peace. Remind us of this right now, the good purposes of our Lord through his word. And so help us to receive with humility. Help us to believe in your word. Help us to act upon it, to live according to it. For your glory, Father, and for the good and the joy and the peace of all of your saints, all of your sons and daughters. It's in Jesus' mighty and powerful name we pray. Amen. James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. I'll be reading from the ESV. Hear the word of the Lord. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Now, if you were listening in last week uh, to last week's message, you uh, should remember that at the beginning of this chapter, uh, in verses 1 through 6, which we covered last week, James was denouncing rich unbelievers, Okay, those not in the church, specifically these landowners who were exploiting and oppressing the poor. Okay, you, you may remember that. And um, the churches that James is writing to, they are actually uh, mainly made up of poor people. Okay? Most of the church in that day were poor. 
And so the very people that James is writing to, they're the very ones who are suffering at the hands of the rich, unbelieving landowners. Okay? And so in our passage today, James, he now redirects his focus and attention to these suffering Christians, and he exhorts them, be patient. Okay? He's like, I know that you're suffering. I know that you're being persecuted. I know that you're being oppressed. I know that you're going through hard times, but be patient. Persevere. Hang in there. Endure through this. And there are three specific exhortations that James gives them and really us to be patient. And uh, if you're taking notes, these will be our points for today. Okay? Three exhortations. The first exhortation that James gives is to be patient for the Lord is coming. That's the first one. Be patient for the Lord is coming. The second exhortation is be patient with one another for the judge is standing at the door. That's the second exhortation. And then the third and final one is be patient in suffering for the Lord is good. Hallelujah. For the Lord is good. And so uh, we're going to spend most of our time in that first and third exhortation because those are sort of the main ones that are related. Um, But we'll we'll still touch on the second one just a little bit, okay? Um, But I, I really hope and I pray that these exhortations will help all of us in whatever difficult circumstances we're in, whether it is because of the COVID or something you're struggling with, that requires patience, I hope that these exhortations would encourage you to be patient, to persevere, okay? Okay, let's look at the first exhortation. Be patient for the Lord is coming. That's where James begins in verses 7 and 8. Let me just read verses 7 and 8 for you again. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And so James is saying, hey, just like the farmer has to wait and be patient to reap the harvest, right? Like once he plants the seed and does everything to prepare for that, like it's out of his hands now. He just has to wait and be patient for it, for the rains to come. In the same way, brothers and sisters, be patient because the harvest, it's coming. Christ is coming. Now, this truth that the Lord is coming, the the fact that one day Christ is coming back, it is a tremendous Resource. In fact, maybe the greatest resource to help us to be patient, even in the worst of trials. And let me tell you why. It's because when Christ comes again, not if Christ comes, but when he comes, because it is a fact. When Christ returns, he is not coming as a baby in the manger. He's not coming to suffer and to die on the cross for all of our sins. He's not coming in total humility like he did the first time. But when Christ comes again, he's coming in total power and total glory. Did you know this? It's not going to look anything like it did the first time. In fact, let me just read for you what it's going to look like when Christ returns a second time as depicted in the end of the Bible, in Revelation. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. I want you to just listen to this and picture this in your minds, okay? This is the second coming. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Picture that white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Now now listen to this and picture this. His eyes are like a flame of fire. Can you see that? A flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems, many crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. 
He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arraigned in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Can you hear the sound of the armies of heaven following Christ on that white horse, coming to make war? Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Quite a different picture of when he came the first time, isn't it? drastically different when christ returns he's not coming as a suffering servant he's coming as a conquering warrior he's coming and he will make war on and judge all evil all evil and all sin will be completely destroyed when the king returns all of it and for the redeemed if you are in christ that means you for the redeemed that christ saves The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 to 4, it tells us this. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. What a glorious picture, isn't it? What a glorious picture. Our suffering on this day will be no more. Those tears that you shed this week, no more. That pain that you're suffering right now, no more on this day. Christ will make all things new. Everything will be restored to the way that it was supposed to be. Sin will no longer corrupt. It will no longer defile. It will no longer destroy. And we will be with Christ in glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Can somebody say hallelujah? Hallelujah. If you're you're the redeemed, this should be like, oh, hallelujah. Because this is your future This is where you're headed, brothers and sisters. That day is your day. We're all on that path to that day. It's coming. And for some 2,000 years now, the reality of this end game, it is the end game. It's happening. We're headed there. The reality of this end game has kept faithful believers patiently enduring. Patiently trusting, patiently persevering through any and every circumstance. Knowing that Christ is coming back. And knowing that when he does, all of the trials that we have patiently endured, they will all have been worth it. All of them. That's really what gives us the tremendous hope to be patient. It's all going to be worth it. I mean, isn't isn't that what really helps us to be patient about anything? Knowing that in the end it's going to be worth it, right? Like, isn't that why we are willing to wait for hours in a line for a roller coaster that only lasts two and a half minutes? Ever done that before? How many of you guys have done that before? Right? I think all of us, right? Isn't that why we're willing to wait? Because we think it's going to be worth it. That two and a half minutes, it's going to be worth it. And usually it's not, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I spent three hours in line for that. Isn't that why we're willing to wait for months and months while we save up for that dream vacation that's only going to last five days? (laughs) Because we think it's going to be worth it. That's why we're willing, right? It's, It's the thought of something being worth it in the end that really fuels us really drives us and really helps us to be patient, right? And, and, and here's the thing, Christian. Here's the thing. When Christ returns, oh, you better believe it's going to be worth it. <laughs> you better believe it will. 
It'll all be worth it. Like on that day, there is not going to be a single ounce of pain or suffering or heartache that you have experienced that will cause you to say, oh, this is not worth it. It's not going to happen. Christ, he's not going to let you down. He won't. You know, the, the Apostle Paul, he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, where's our DT at? You guys all know this verse, right? Romans 8, chap, chapter 8, verse 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Did you hear that? Not worth comparing. And that is quite a statement coming from the Apostle Paul. Because this dude suffered more than any one of us in this room. I'm sure he suffered greatly. And here he is writing, I consider that everything I'm going through not even worth comparing with the glory that is coming. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17, Apostle Paul, he says, for our light and momentary troubles. That's how he describes all of our suffering in life. In life. Light and momentary. Here one moment and it's going to be gone. <laughs> they, they are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. In other words, the Apostle Paul, the word of God is telling you it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Do you believe this, brothers and sisters? I mean, do you really believe that whatever struggle or pain that you have faced in your life, some of you have struggled a lot, or that are, you're facing right now, currently, or that you will face in this life because we will face troubles, do you really believe that it'll all be worth it when it is all said and done? It'll be worth it. Do you believe this? If you're saying, not really, you should because it's true. The word of God does not lie to you. It's true. And not only is it true, but again, as I said before, this is a tremendous resource to help you to be patient no matter what the circumstance. Because you know whatever you're going through, it's not the end of the story. There's more to come. Glory is coming. The king is going to return. Christ will come again. And not only will he come again, but his coming, James says, it is at hand. Did you notice that in, in verse 8, at the end of verse 8? He says, you also be patient, establish your hearts. Why? For the coming of the Lord is at hand, he says. You know what that means? You know what it means when James is saying, and the Bible says that the coming of the Lord is at hand? You know what it means? It means we're living in the last days. Did you guys know this? You know, sometimes we think people are kind of crazy when they say, the end is coming, right? It's the end times. Repent. Like, we think they're kind of crazy, but in a sense, they're actually right. We are living at the, in the end times. And you know why we're living in the end times? It's because in terms of God's redemptive history, his plan to bring salvation, we're in the final stage. We're in the last stage of God's redemptive history. The only thing left to happen in God's, in the big picture of God's redemptive history is Christ to come again. That's it. Christ has already come. Christ has already suffered. He's already died. He's already been resurrected. The Spirit of God has already been given to the people, God's people. And now the next and final thing to happen, again, big picture. I'm not saying it's like the only thing that's going to happen in the church. Of course not. But the, in terms of God's big picture, redemption history, the only thing left to happen is for Christ to return, to bring about the new creation, to establish fully on earth his kingdom as it is in heaven forever. So we, brothers and sisters, are living in the last days. You could say that to one another. Hey, we're living in the last days, guys. Let's serve the Lord. <laughs> Let's live for him. We're living in the last days. And that means that Christ can return at any moment. Any moment. Now, of course, no one knows how long these last days are going to be. Okay? I know a lot of people... Try to, try, to, try to say they know, like, how long these last days are, like, when Jesus is coming. If anybody tells you that or you see anything on social media about Jesus is coming on this day, do not believe that. Because the Bible tells us very clearly, even nobody knows. 
Not even Christ knows. Only the Father in heaven knows. So don't believe any of that garbage, okay? But, again, the point is that in terms of within God's redemptive history, Christ's return, it's imminent. It's at hand. And, and this really is even more motivation, even more motivation to be patient, to hang on, to persevere in whatever trials that you're facing because Christ is coming, and he's coming soon. Like this day, it's approaching for the believer. It's, it's, it's coming. Like did you realize that every single one of us in this room, we are now hours Hours closer to this day than when we woke up this morning. <laughs> hours closer to it. We're, we're, we're 2,000 years, actually, or so closer to this day than James was when he was writing this, right? We're getting closer. And you guys know time, it goes really fast, doesn't it? Like we mentioned earlier, can you believe it's August? Where did the year go, right? Oh, my goodness. School's about to start. Or school's starting already. Oh, my goodness. Falls right around the corner. Like time goes fast as you get older. It's coming, <laughs> Christ is coming in glory, with glory. So be patient. That's James's first exhortation. Be patient for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now let's look at the second exhortation. And again, we're not going to spend too much time on this one. But the second one is be patient with one another. Why? For the judge is standing at the door. That's in verse 9. James says, Don't, do not grumble with one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now, at first glance, I had trouble with this because it doesn't really seem like this verse fits in this section, right? Like, James has touched upon the theme of grumbling before earlier, but here it kind of seems out of place. Like, all of a sudden, like, what, what do you mean, don't grumble with one another? Okay? But I was helped out as I, as I was studying it and looking at the commentaries. Um, actually, when you think about it, it does make a lot of sense for James to talk here about grumbling, not grumbling with one another. Because, remember, these believers that he's writing to, they are suffering. They are being oppressed. They are being exploited by the rich. They're going through really difficult times. Like, tensions are high, right? Pressure is high. And I don't know about you, but isn't it super easy when you're facing difficult circumstances, when you're going through hard times, to just get irritated and frustrated and angry and maybe even critical of other people. Isn't that easy? Like, isn't it super easy, like, when you're having a bad day to just get nasty on somebody and just blow up on them? Not because of really anything in them, but just you're just not happy. Like, I experience this a lot. I'll just confess to you. Like, when I'm having a bad day, I feel really bad for my wife <laughs> because I'm just so easily irritated. I can just pick out flaws more easily. Things bother me more easily like when I'm having a bad day, and I can be quick to even criticize and start quarreling and grumbling when I'm having a bad day. And so James, he's, he's exhorting us who live in a fallen world where difficult circumstances can so easily provoke us to be impatient with each other. Maybe even today, this morning, you experience that. You're just in a bad mood and everybody's bothering you today. He's exhorting us to be patient with one another. Be patient. Don't grumble against each other. Don't quarrel with one another. Don't judge each other. Don't criticize one another. Why? Because the judge is standing at the door ready to judge. Now, let that be a clear image in your mind the next time you think about grumbling against your spouse. The judge is right there. Or you think about grumbling against your coworker or your boss. The judge is right here. Or the next time you think about grumbling against that small group leader or that small group member, like, oh, the judge is right there ready to judge, watching you, listening to your every word. And Christ says that we will be judged for every careless word that we have spoken. We'll be judged for that. And so in one sense, the, the return of Christ, it is meant to encourage us to be patient in suffering, 
because the Lord is coming. But in another sense here, it's to admonish us, to warn us, to be patient with one another. Because the judge is coming and we're all going to have to stand before him and give an account of every word that came out of our mouth. The bad words we've said about that brother or sister or my wife or my husband or whoever. How we've treated one another. So James is saying, be patient with one another because the judge is standing at the door. Now let's move on and let's get to that third and final exhortation. James, he returns again to, that, to the emphasis that he has in that first exhortation, which is to be patient in suffering. He returns here again, and he says, be patient in suffering, brothers and sisters, for God is good. God is good. That's his third exhortation. Be patient in suffering because your Lord is good. Turn to one another and say, your Lord is good. Your Lord, he is good. And as examples of God's goodness in patience and suffering, James points us to the prophets in verse 10, and then ultimately he points us to Job in verse 11. Okay. Let's, let's look at the prophets first. Verse 10, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. In other words, James is saying, hey, look at, the, look at the prophets who suffered. Like, consider guys like Jeremiah or, or maybe Isaiah. These guys who suffered immensely for speaking the truth of God's word. These guys who suffered greatly. Look at these guys, and when we think of them, when we're thinking about these guys, are any of us like, what a waste of a life. Like, what a life terribly lived. Like, they could have lived such a better and more productive life. Are any of us thinking that? If you're a Christian, you shouldn't be thinking that. Right? Because as a Christian, we know these guys were faithful. Under the worst of persecution, they were faithful and steadfast, and they served the Lord. And not only that, but we as Christians, we know the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, Verses 11 through 12, who promises this. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 to 12. Blessed are you. Now, what, what do you expect to come after that? Who are rich, who are healthy, who live a good life, who live 90 years. I mean, that's what we would expect. Society would say that. But here's what God says. Blessed are you when others revile you. And persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. What? And then Jesus says this. This is his promise. Rejoice and be glad. Why? For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These prophets are blessed. They are rejoicing right now in this moment. Like they're parting up in heaven with the angels and with the Holy One face to face. They're not looking back on their lives and thinking, oh, man, my life was really hard for those 40, 50 years on earth. Man, uh, it was really difficult. I really wish I could do things differently. They're not thinking that at all. No way in the world they're thinking that because they're in glory. They're in glory with the Lord, experiencing the blessed eternity that they now get to spend with him in the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Forever, without any sin, without any suffering, without any pain. Forever and ever and ever. They have received a great reward. And so James is exhorting us, brothers and sisters, be patient. God is good. He's got an eternal great reward for you. Be patient. And then James points us to Job at the end of verse 11. He says, you've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, it is 
It's interesting that James uses Job as the example to encourage us to be patient. Because if you've read the book of Job, it's messy. <laughs> it's a messy book. Like, it doesn't seem like Job is all that patient. It doesn't seem like he's really the model for patience. Like, if you've never read the book of Job, basically, let me just explain it to you. Job, he is a righteous dude. It says he's blameless. And he's filthy rich. Okay? Like, he's got a big family. He's got all this land, all this cattle. Like, he's rich. Rich dude. And God allowed keyword allowed Satan to basically take away everything that he has. He lost his wealth. He lost his servants. He lost his children. Pretty much he lost everything except his wife. And if you know the story of Job, that's not really that good of a thing. <laughs> Cause, no, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> she actually just nags at him and she tells him, stop trusting the Lord. It's not actually a good thing. I didn't mean that as a negative thing towards wives. I hope that I don't get an email later <laughs> about that. Like, what are you saying about wives? Oh, no, that's just the book of Job. It's the, in the Bible, okay? But, but the bulk of this book, um, the bulk of it, like really the majority of this book is just chapter after chapter of Job honestly venting, honestly complaining, uh, even honestly questioning God. Why is this happening? So it's, it's a messy book. But, and here's why I think James points at Job, but through it all, if we read the whole, whole book, we see that Job never abandons God. He never leaves God. All of his venting, all of his complaining, all of his questions, they're all directed at God. They're all done in relationship with God. And, and this is really significant, guys. This is really significant because it tells us that when God tells us to be patient, he's not expecting us to shut up, suck it up. Just be patient. I don't want to hear it from you. Be patient. I'm coming soon. So just be quiet and wait. That's not how our God is. He allows for honesty. He allows for you to vent even, to Vent your frustrations, your complaints even, your questions. Why is this happening? He allows for all of this so long as it is done in relationship with him. He can handle all of that. Too often we take our questions, our, our complaints, our accusations to somewhere else, right? On the internet, to non-believers, right? To other people. Like, oh, God, this guy. Take it to the Lord. He can handle that stuff. And so Job, in the end, he never left his Lord. And in the end, we can see that Job's suffering, I mean, as difficult as it must have been. I mean, nobody has suffered more than Job in this room. Nobody. I know there are a lot of suffering people, but you look at the account of Job and you get humbled. Like, oh, my goodness. Okay. As difficult as it must have been for Job, it wasn't meaningless. And it wasn't malicious. God wasn't just messing around or, or uh, being spiteful with Job. Let's just see how God, let's see how he does. <laughs> he wasn't just doing that. God had a specific purpose, which was full of compassion and mercy toward Job. In other words, God was good to Job. And if you're wondering, how was he good to Job? Well, if you don't know the, the end of the story, basically God restores everything that Job had had lost by double. Like, that's pretty good, right? It's pretty good. But that's not even the half of it. The real kicker is what Job says at the end of this book. Job chapter 42, verses 5 and 6. This is after God finally shows up, after Job has just been questioning and questioning and accusing and, and frust venting his frustrations. God finally shows up and he confronts Job with these 77 questions, okay? He's got 77 questions for Job uh, to respond to and Job can't say a thing. But this is what Job finally says after he hears all this. He says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself, and I repent in 
dust, dashes, dust and ashes. I, I combine those words. Dust and ashes. You know what Job is saying here in, this, in these verses? Basically, Job is saying this. You know, God, I, I heard of you. Like, I, I heard some things about you. Like, I had a certain knowledge about you. Like, I, I knew you to a certain degree before, but now, now I see you. Now I know you even more. Now I've experienced more of you. And that is enough for Job. That is all Job needed to repent and say no more. That's all he needed. And, and that might sound like just a trivial thing, that fact, but this has huge implications for us, brothers and sisters. Huge. Because what this shows us, Job's response after everything that he's gone through, what this shows us is that to know God deeper, to be more intimate with God, to really know him, I mean really know him, it is more than sufficient reward to compensate for any suffering that we have experienced in this life. In other words, God is enough. He is enough. That's what Job is basically testifying to. He's saying, God, you are enough. I don't, I don't need anything else. I mean, he says this even before he got all the stuff restored, right? When he had nothing, he says, I don't need anything else. I've lost everything. I've suffered immensely. But if I have you, if my eye sees you, it's enough. I I repent. I repent. Did you know that Job doesn't even get any answers to the questions that he's been asking God? <laughs> he doesn't get any of the questions. He's asking, why am I suffering, God? Why is this happening to me? What did I do wrong? What sin is there in my life? Like, why is this happening? And God doesn't answer any of that. Not one question does he answer. He simply shows up, and he reveals himself to Job, and that's enough. Job repents at the end of the book. And this, brothers and sisters, is the ultimate good and compassionate and merciful purpose that God had for Job and that he has for all of us in our trials. He wants us to know him, to truly know him, not just in the head, in your heart, to believe in him because knowing him is the greatest reward. There simply is no greater treasure than to have God himself, the author of life. <laughs> to have God. Like nothing can compare to that. There's no more valuable prize. He is everything. Infinitely more than enough to satisfy and to quench all of your longings, all of your desires for all of your days and forevermore. He's enough for you and for me. And so James's exhortation to us by looking at our brother Job is be patient because your Lord is good. Our God is good. And, and then you say, all the time. Let's try that again, guys. <laughs> you might have got thrown, thrown off because I said the R part, right? God is good. All the time. All the time. God, is good. God is good. Job's life shows us that God has a glorious purpose. He is working in and through the trials. They're not meaningless. They're not purposeless. He's working in them for his ultimate glory, number one, his glory, which is to be known through the nations, every single nation bowing before him and worship. That's his number one purpose. And also for your ultimate joy, which actually comes from that. Your ultimate joy is going to come from knowing God, truly knowing him and worshiping him. That's where it comes from. And let me just end with this. We're going to end with this. You know, if Job 
could be patient and trust God in his suffering, if Job could do this, if he's the example, we, brothers and sisters, have much more reason to be patient and to trust God in our suffering, whatever it is we're going through. And you know why? You know why. It's because your eye has seen. My eye has seen. Our eyes have seen what Job, at least at that time, didn't see. We have seen the greatest demonstration of the goodness of God. The greatest demonstration. And where is that? Christ Jesus, our Lord. We have Christ. We have the one who entered into our suffering. He came into the mess that we made of this broken world. And not only that, he took our sins upon his shoulders and he suffered. He bled and he died for them on the cross so that we could be totally forgiven. Forgiven of the very sins that brought the suffering into this world, that made a mess of this world. He forgave us of these sins. We have Christ crucified for the forgiveness of all of your sins. All of your sins have been paid by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation for you, brothers and sisters. We have Christ crucified. But not only that, not only do we have Christ crucified, because he didn't just die, did he? We have Christ resurrected. We have the risen Lord. He rose again to newness of life. He defeated the grave. And, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons that he did this, one of the reasons that God raised Christ from the dead by the Holy Spirit is so that we would know and see that one day you in Christ, me in Christ, we in Christ will rise with him to a glorious future. To live in the new creation with resurrected bodies, perfect bodies that never get old, that never hurt, right? That back, oh, not again. Resurrected bodies, no more suffering, no more death, no more sin because Christ has won. He's won. He's conquered the grave. Death has been defeated in Christ. This Christian is your hope. This Christian is your confidence. This Christian is your glorious inheritance in Christ. And the empty tomb seals that, proves it. So you can be patient. You have infinite reason to be patient because Christ has overcome. He's risen. And he's with you. And he's for you. And come what may, come whatever trials may come in this life, surely he will hold you fast. Surely he will bring you home. Because he's promised us in his word that he will. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that you have not left us without hope in such a broken world. Thank you that you humbled yourself by sending your son into this broken world to suffer and, and to bleed and to die for the sins that caused all this brokenness, to defeat that sin once and for all, to conquer that sin. Thank you that you raised him to newness of life, that Christ lives, and that he will come again to usher in the new creation. Thank you for the glorious hope that we have that not even death can take away. That nothing can separate us from your love. Thank you for your faithfulness, God. Thank you. And we thank you for your promise. I just want to close us with the promise in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Hear God's promise to us. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and body and be 
kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to this promise. He who calls you is faithful. Hallelujah. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And all God's people rejoice in that promise and say, in Jesus' name, we receive it and we celebrate. And all God's people say, amen, amen. You may have your seats. God bless you, brothers and sisters.